Hello everyone, this is your instructor, Lauren Deeg, Associate Professor of Urban Planning. Football's back, we're celebrating that tonight, and so let's take a look at our next studio project. Good evening, everyone. Uh, here's a brief introduction with a few examples continuing on our theme of positive and negative space and positive negative two-dimensional composition design. It's interesting to look back at some of our previous designs and design work and, and uh, look at them uh, through the lens of positive and negative uh, balance and how that contributes to composition and interest and contrast and readability. Uh, it's, it's always helpful for us to begin uh, with with these particular uh, compositional studies as we continue to build our our, our education forward into uh, other design aspects. Interesting enough, in many cases, the positive negative design is still recognizable. In the case here, the U.S. flag, uh, the the notion of the simplicity of something in positive negative can also be translated into a lot of our computer imagery, uh, bitmap images, uh, eight bit era images. Uh, when I began computer programming back in middle school in 1988, uh, uh, we would actually program, uh, we would plot out the coordinates of every single one of these points in either in order to make an image. So computer programming and image programming back then was a complex, uh, long uh, process of, of mapping out every single image. One of the reasons it's called a bitmap, uh, a, this type of image, a bitmap, is is that each bit is mapped according to its original location. So much of our uh, original, uh, early, early <laughs> uh, computer imagery uh, involved mapping out the bit for every single image. Later on when the Macintosh was introduced, uh, there, there was a wonderful program called MacPaint that had a interface called FatBits in which you could create, start to create images that could be then uh, transported across the Mac platform and, and otherwise. Those of you who grew up with Game Boys or other smaller um, lower res resolution uh, uh, game consoles may be familiar with that, but uh, this is one of the characters from Mario Kart, as you can probably can tell. Uh, other com early computer imagery involved taking complex grayscale images and then mapping them out in what we, we called halftone, and that halftone process of computerizing it and preparing it for uh, a standard printing press. Uh, some of these patterns are quite quite intricate and quite beautiful just by themselves so you realize that they were part of much larger images. If you squint your eyes a little bit, you can see someone looking back at you at the screen. Ooh. Uh, and, and, what, uh, and what we find is that uh, some of that early computer art from the 1980s is still quite engaging today and, and translates to making uh, very uh, simply by uh, repetition of materials. You could probably imagine this halftone image being projected onto the side of the building or even uh, possibly uh, painted or printed uh, with any number of materials. Um, as time went on, the bits started to get a little bit more sophisticated. They allowed for 45 degree angles. You can see bits of, of uh, uh, pieces here that are actually made up of several squares and triangles. It's kind of part of the inspiration of where our most recent project came from. And, and so uh, later on into the 1980s and early 1990s, uh, uh, resolutions uh, of, of devices were starting to uh, handle more complex images like this. Uh, so, uh, and so you can see if you squint again, there's a gentleman's face looking back at you. Uh, very interesting philosophical and perhaps methodological thinking about about the role of, of that technology and how it starts to create a perception of shape and reality. Some interesting things to think about as we look at some of these early concepts of digital art. As I mentioned, many of these images were made by mapping out every single uh, situation. And so the balance between positive and negative space started to create those notions of the edges. This is very much in line with what we were talking about in contour drawing, and that our edge of perception of two, two colors or surfaces or materials actually started to lead to our perception uh, of the image itself. It's, it's um, remarkable that you could, you could in fact, arrange just a few squares to, to uh, assimilate this particular image of this particular Disney character. Or that with just one, two, three shades of orange, you could, you could uh, give the impression or the gestalt, that German word we remember from our earlier lectures, uh, the illusion of curvature, even in an 8-bit situation, uh, and how this particular shape could be 
could be used across different video game platforms. The 8-bit imagery sticks with us. It is from early computer imagery, but it sticks with us. And, and of course, there's lots of different uh, fashionable goods, and even sunglasses and ties that are made uh, to look like they are 8-bit. Early work in the Sega and uh, Nintendo universe also also mapped out each of these images. You can see the early suit from Super Mario Brothers, the 8-bit version of Mario and his initial uh, understanding there still has that that incredible way of of, of demarking his clothing versus uh, the features of his face and the like. Same for Sonic and Zelda. Uh, looking at back at Herald imagery and and how it translated or how it uh, uh, was able to be seen in 8-bit, it requires a little bit of abstraction. It requires an act of abstraction. We remember from Latin that ab abstraction uh, or, ab or abstract, abstractus, the verb form of abstractus, means to pull away or draw away uh, one layer of information across in the whole. And so 8-bit was, was very much an exercise in abstraction. How could you communicate one image versus another uh, if you didn't have the full uh, facilities of, of, of different graphic imagery, if you were limited perhaps by the interface of the 8-bit. And so there was a challenge for a lot of designers to think about that. Lightbright was another thing that is quite collectible today. You could probably see these on eBay, but uh, Lightbright was a fantastic 1970s era toy that, which, which featured a backlit, uh, backlit cabinet uh, or, or appliance, if you will, with different uh, black paper um, uh, uh, patterns in which you would ins in insert these plastic bits which would then pick up the light and, and start to project the image. Um, these were quite popular in the 70s and I was quite envious of anybody who had one. Um, <laughs> so they're quite collectible today, but it was an interesting process to start to create the image and then backlight it. Uh, and I'm sure there's probably still some of these sitting in someone's shag carpet somewhere. Tile itself, or the making of tile itself, uh, if you've been to cities that have subway systems, subway tile, it's, uh, there's some really interesting patterns that can be made uh, uh, across different subway tiles and, and how they capture uh, or simplify more complex imagery. So it in itself is, is an application in materials and interior design. We also use this notion of pixelation or simplification to, to uh, across some different graphic design uh, capabilities. The entire Earth could, in fact, be summarized with just a series of bits. Further on, uh, it, I think later on in the digital universe, uh, at, as, you can, as, as Nintendo and Sega continued, um, the art and imagery started to become a little bit more complex. More colors were available, but still you can see there's quite a bit of thought behind uh, how the reflection off of R2's dome uh, is actually creating that illusion of curvature. Again, it works better if you squint a little bit and limit the amount of light coming into your iris, but uh, that illusion of, of uh, the three-dimensionality of R2 is, is, is evident with just the choices of grayscale. Same for the Stormtrooper's helmet. More art here. This is Boba Fett with more of a triangular parallelogram, actually a combination of triangles and parallelograms uh, for another, another type of 8-bit imagery. This is also a fun, fun kind of quilt pattern. If you're interested in quilts and geometry of quilts, there's a lot of uh, patterns that, that uh, use this kind of 8-bit kind of thinking to uh, create uh, more complex images. The same can be said for uh, font making. Uh, I hope all of you at some point in your life have the opportunity to create a font and uh, the difference between vector graphics that, that we would use in Adobe Illustrator versus bitmap or raster graphics which is the vehicle for Photoshop, the two differences between the two programs is basically this, and that fonts in Illustrator are, are composed of vector, which involve a computer code that, that maps out points and then joins them with lines, same for AutoCAD, versus Photoshop, which is the, the back to the bitmap or the raster graphics. So every single bit is mapped out and, and processed by the computer. That, that very process is what allows you to see images on your iPhone or on your computer right now. So knowing the difference between vector graphics and raster graphics is a key component for, for understanding your computing uh, knowledge as we move forward. 
but it's those differences that uh, that have allowed us to make fonts over the years, and uh, and sometimes those differences get lost. As you can see, there's a huge difference between the vector version of this particular font versus the raster version. Same goes for more complex images and patterns that might be influencing tile pro uh, patterns or otherwise. Fabrics are also part of this, so much of this kind of imagery can lead directly into stitching and and uh, and connecting computers to looms and, uh, and starting to produce complex imagery on fabrics. Much of what you wear is, is probably influenced by this process or, or some, some other uh, goods that are across your home. Rugs have con consistently over history had, have been able to uh, c contain a lot of cultural patterns of, of weaving and so the deliberate process of every single line of or, or non-line of this positive negative space across this uh, the, uh, from Asia Minor and into the Far East, these wonderful rugs that, uh, that, uh, that are still present uh, across our world uh, have some wonderful geometries and wonderful stories and wonderful codes that are built into the imagery that we see there. Same goes for Amish quilts across uh, Ohio, Indiana, Michigan. Uh, a lot of great codes or stories are built into the designs that you find in Amish quilts. Today, the, these interesting uh, images that computers generate called QR codes allow our phones to read them and then lead them to further information. A few years ago, a colleague and I wrote a whole paper about how QR codes could be uh, used to help assess design work or assess uh, uh, design students' work. And so uh, for something which was invented and, and adapted by the auto, auto industry in order to track parts, through the manufacturing system, uh, the QR code has become almost ubiquitous. You can find it on your mail. You can find it uh, uh, in signage and in other graphics. Uh, your phones are now smart enough just to just to pick it up right away. And in fact, if you hold up uh, hold up Snapchat uh, uh, to a QR code, it'll take you right to a website. Uh, still, a pretty effective way of, of of connecting people to information through their phones. So where are we going? We're going to continue with your city. Uh, continue to analyze the ordering principles, how primary elements and ordering principles come together to, to create that image of your city. But you are going to be creating and building a knight's shield. So if you imagine your city having a knight, it would be a uh, public safety official or, or, a, or a nobility or a character. If you start to imagine someone who lives uh, in your city, uh, needing a shield of some kind for either a symbolic or, or uh, ritual or uh, some other official uh, capacity, or if, if they wanted to go into battle. Uh, kind of combining some of our thinking from the Herald and uh, combining thinking from our tile, but bringing that together into the design of a new shield. We have completed an emblem. Uh, so we recall that emblems were heraldic devices or symbolic objects as a distinctive badge of a nation, organization, or family. And so uh, thinking about popular culture uh, with, with the Game of Thrones uh, world or Game of Thrones universe, each of the different uh, families had, had a different herald associated with them. Where the same goes for some of the characters in The Mandalorian, if you're more familiar with that. Um, Harry Potter, of course, the characters have in Harry Potter come from different houses. They too have have similar heralds. In medieval Europe, uh, each each of the co coats of arms across medieval Europe are for the different kingdoms and principalities and duchies and protectorates. Uh, all these different heralds were allowed people to be able to identify themselves from a distance and determine if they were friend or foe, if they were in, in the wilderness, uh, and or uh, uh, hang their particular herald banners in, in, in court or in assembly uh, to show the different gatherings. And so a lot of these uh, herald images uh, continue to be part of, of uh, flags of different cities, regions, uh, and, and, uh, and nationalities across Europe. Here in the United States, it's interesting that soccer has continued to keep the herald emblem uh, shield effect uh, as part of its logo design, not so much with hockey. We've had a good discussion in previous lectures about hockey logos, but it's interesting to me that soccer football continues that tradition of the shield 
as in, in terms of how they start to form their logo and identity, even, even newer uh, teams today, St. Louis City, which is coming in a couple of years, uh, FC Cincinnati, which just moved from NASL to MLS, Indy 11, moving from NASL to USL, and your Louisville City uh, from the USL. And you can see that each of them still has that commonality of, of that notion of the Herald Shield uh, 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 embodied into it, probably coming from the uh, soccer's origins in England as association football. But each of these shields is interesting because they, they, they contain stories about the city. They contain stories about the culture in which uh, they represent. Interestingly enough, uh, Louisville City had proposed a new logo in, in 2019 uh, that had a lot of things built into it, uh, uh, rebranding of the team itself, uh, making connections to the Louisville City flag, uh, five sides representing the five bridges across the Ohio River, purple triangle pointing upward to, to think about momentum, horizontal line representing the Ohio River, uh, the dividing line between Jeffersonville and Louisville. Interestingly enough, this, this rebrand in 2019 was a complete failure and was scrapped after only three days. So even though <laughs> uh, it, uh, it takes on a lot of the more traditional aspects, the fan base in Louisville was, was completely rejected of the idea. So they, they fell back and, uh, and rebranded again in the latter part of 2019. Uh, but, but their logo does contain a few interesting elements. So, uh, so stars are very typical in, in soccer logos is that they signify the number of championships. That's true for national teams as well as, as club teams. The Louisville City skyline is really nice because it has it kind of flows together in an interesting way from the Humana building and, and over to the couple of the insurance buildings. And so the Louisville skyline is distinctive, and you can see how they have abstracted and uh, simplified uh, this, this, these notions of, of window and, and, uh, and of dimension and shade and shadow. So the distinctive skyline of Louisville becomes part of the, of the shield here. There are still references to the, the, the city flag in that the fleur de lis, which uh, re remarks the French heritage and French colonial uh, presence in Louisville, as well as St. Louis, uh, is, is still present. But then there's a distinctive, uh, the oak of the bourbon barrel is, is actually referenced in there. You have, to, you have to know that it's there, but it's, that is a bourbon barrel, which is uh, a distinctive pro product of, of Kentucky. This, this I found fascinating, that the new FC Cincinnati, uh, FC Cincinnati, when they moved from, uh, from NASL to, uh, to MLS, did a rebrand, and uh, there's all kinds of stuff uh, hidden in here. Look at this. Three seasons of play before joining the MLS. C for Cincinnati. Uh, the main represents the seven hills of Cincinnati. The crown, uh, it remarks its nickname of the Queen City. And then other references to German heritage, uh, which uh, Cincinnati has a, 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 a long history of, of, uh, of German immigrants uh, throughout the latter part of the 19th century into the 20th century. So lots of symbolism kind of hidden into this. A lot of discussion goes into these, and, and uh, fans are extremely passionate and, uh, and in some cases knowledgeable about the logo uh, as they rally behind their team. And so... Uh, at, similar with hockey, uh, soccer logos are, are quite substantial in terms of their meaning, their history, and the references that they start to make. In the 11, uh, uh, the NASL, now USL team in Indianapolis, um, its, its herald makes a couple of different references. There's, this is a reference to the star in the middle of the Indianapolis city flag, an image of victory. Uh, this is the sculpture that sits on top of the mon of monument circle in the monument. Uh, 11 refers to the... 11th Voluntary Infantry Regiment in the Civil War, which, which was a volunteer uh, regiment. Their distinctive uniforms, which made them different from, from uh, 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 Army regulars. Uh, and the color scheme, you notice the color scheme has been adopted for, with the red, uh, the powder blue, and then the navy blue. So, so the, the pieces or, or colors of this particular uniform make up the color scheme. And then finally, because Indianapolis has such a great uh, automotive racing heritage, a reference to the checkered flag. We'll also be referring back to our city layouts, uh, the, the project you just completed, your nine tile uh, array or your nine tile grid. Uh, to relate it to more to architecture, landscape architecture and urban planning, it's interesting to find examples of 
of those that have uh, distinctive ordering systems. And we've shared some of these with you before, but I, I always love making uh, references to geometries and ordering systems. Uh, this, this is an elder care facility uh, right next to the Saginaw Chippewa Indian Tribe and near the Soaring Eagle Casino, about a mile from where I grew up uh, in Mount Pleasant, Michigan. And I, I'm just fascinated by how, um, how the firm, uh, the architecture and planning firm here, made reference to some of, some of the geometries that are often found across uh, Saginaw Chippewa uh, Native art. Um, while, while thinking about the form and function of how an elder care facility operates. So a large central atrium with, with three, uh, uh, four, five, six wings um, of, of procession, entry, utility, uh, storage, um, uh, probably food uh, and services, uh, deliveries, drop-off, waste. Uh, there's, there's, there's a wandering garden for, for uh, memory patients or Alzheimer's patients. And then there are three, three council circles uh, beyond each each um, each wing, and so each hallway doesn't doesn't look at it at the end of a hallway. Each hallway continues, in in the sense that each corridor uh, uh, leads to one of these these council circles. Uh, so really, a distinctive uh, design when it comes to the blending of architecture and landscape architecture. Distinctive design and uh, from a planning perspective of how how all of this is ordered together. Distinctive design with how many ordering systems are are present here, including radial centralized, centralized, uh, cluster, uh, and, and linear. Lots of different systems coming together here from the ordering and organizing systems. So just from, from looking at it in Google Earth, a distinctive design. Uh, but it makes reference, makes important reference to uh, some of the geometry and artwork that is found across uh, native, uh, native beadwork, uh, native folk art, uh, native dress, uh, that is personal to the Saginaw Chippewa Indian tribe. So this is as much of a reflection of their culture as this is. And so I, I, look, to, I look to the Saginaw Chippewa and other uh, native peoples because they have a very, very close relationship between their arts, uh, their crafts, their, their, their approach to fashion and dance and, uh, and ceremonial and sacred imagery, uh, as well as, as, well as uh, uh, some of their activities that, that unite all those different things. But then uh, how that starts to translate back into their approach to architecture, landscape architecture, and urban planning. It is, it is a great reminder for us to see these examples and, uh, and understand that it all kind of unites together as an expression of their culture and as a preservation of their culture, language, tradition, customs, family, uh, family gatherings, uh, and, and, uh, traditional arts. So this is the Saginaw Chippewa tribe of, of Michigan. This is their official logo. It was designed, I believe, about 30 years ago. Uh, there's some key uh, imagery here referring to specific plants, uh, uh, specific uh, birds, uh, in the, in the, in the uh, distinctive feathers here. These are pheasant feathers, and I believe these are eagle or hawk feathers. Uh, and so uh, those come together in, in their official logo, which is encapsulated in a circle. The circle is extremely important to the Chippewa in that the circle uh, signifies unity of, of, of uh, different, different generations, different families, and a uh, clear relationship uh, between, uh, between the, the people and the earth. So the circle is important. It's, it's part, part and parcel why it's so noticeable. Other themes, uh, including some of the timber frame construction, uh, references to other uh, uh, indigenous and vernacular structures, uh, uh, whether they be uh, hunting structures or uh, temporary camp structures or primitive structures. Some of that imagery and themes are brought in as well as, uh, as, as, well as other materials and colors in the design. This is from Edmund London Associates Architects and Planners out of, out of the Detroit area. And then the interior, uh, all of the colors and finishes too are reminiscent and respectful of, of the, some of those similar themes. One thing that Saginaw Chippewa are, are known for now is, is a wonderful uh, group of artists that, that uh, sculpt uh, alabaster. Alabaster is, uh, is, is quarried uh, nearby in, uh, in lower Michigan and is extremely easy to carve. Alabaster is a decomposed version of white marble, uh, which uh, pockets of that were left behind by the Wisconsin Glacier. Uh, so so uh, some wonderful traditions starting to continue 
and uh, and be shared with generations as this tribe honors their elders with distinctive architecture and a uh, a full uh, uh, elder care and healthcare environment. So that was an example from the real world that kind of talks about and 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 uh, encapsulates a lot of the ordering systems as well as positive and negative space and some of the, the primary elements. That said, uh, your design of your shield for your for your city for your knight uh, must combine and communicate the following items: your section number, your favorite or best emblem from unit one, your favorite best unit two city layout or tile. So uh, in many cases, you'll find here in Cap 101, we, we, we look for opportunities for projects to lead into one another, to build on one another. We call this an iterative design process in the sense that you are recalling or referencing previous design projects in the design of your current project. We will do this throughout the semester. We have a way of of communicating uh, to you uh, the importance of iterative design uh, by using uh, things repetitively and how they can build on one another. So you'll take your section number, and my, in my students' case, section number three, uh, both for my last year and this year, uh, your favorite emblem, uh, your favorite tile or layout, and, and either hierarchy, repetition, or transformation. Uh, in some cases, instructors will assign this to you. In some cases, you may choose. That's that's up to your section instructor as to whether you will be using hierarchy, repetition, or transformation to sort of a guiding principle for how this uh, this shield comes together. So, aspects or elements of your emblem, aspects or elements of your favorite tile, integrating your section number in an interesting way, and then bringing it all together, putting it all together under hierarchy, repetition, or transformation. So all these things come together to design. Aha. So moving forward, start by uh, either printing some graph paper. There's printable graph paper websites where you can uh, choose uh, different sizes and things like that. I rec we recommend a half inch by half inch grid um, uh, uh, for the, the final layout. For the preliminary layout, you could probably use quarter inch uh, grid, grid graph paper or otherwise just to kind of work with uh, a possible design. Keep in mind though, there's another constraint. We love constraints in the design process. Each square in your grid must be either a full black, this triangle, this triangle, this triangle, full white, or this triangle. Aha. So designs must be uh, composites of one of these six possibilities for each single square. So test some designs on graph paper using this limited uh, uh, constraint or this limited menu. And then when you have uh, a design idea, lay out a half inch by half inch grid on, on, uh, on railroad board or chipboard. Cut out the negative space for spray paint for a clean edge. You can use some newspaper for larger mask areas. But, but laying out that grid and starting to cut out that that shape for spray paint uh, will, will become a way of masking or a way of creating uh, uh, creating what we might call uh, a template. Okay, so in spray art and urban art, templates are often used uh, to to repeat a particular spray pattern. In this case, you can see there's actually two cutouts here. So there was a white cutout and then um, another cutout here. You can see it cut out here. Are really well, really elegantly crafted here. But in this case, there's actually two templates uh, in which this particular artist is using to reproduce this image uh, several times. And that's a common theme in urban art and uh, graffiti art is to use templates or cutouts from heavy cardboard uh, or even plexiglass to make repetitive imagery. There's a little bit of notion to the craft of this because uh, if, if the template does not make complete contact with the base, you can see that there's a little bit of element of overspray. We're, we're aiming for the cleanest images that you can make uh, uh, here. And so it involves uh, some meticulous craft uh, and uh, good cutouts and uh, good affixa affixation uh, from this chipboard, which is the, what we'll use to make the template, onto white foam core. 
spray paint, all spray painting in the cap building must be done in the famous, or shall we say infamous, cap paint room. Uh, the cap paint room is located in the ground floor, what we might call the basement level. Uh, it's right by the central elevators uh, and restrooms uh, that, that are found on, on each part of, of the cap building floors. Um, so if you simply take the staircase, uh, the center, central staircase all the way down, you'll see uh, the, the, the infamous paint room at the end of the short hallway next to the, next to the men's restroom on the basement floor, what we might call the ground floor. Uh, your predecessors have been busy, if you will. The cap paint room is a free zone when it comes to spray paint graffiti. This was done by one of your Farky uh, predecessors back in 2020. Uh, the Sparkies actually did a design and then the Farkies responded by painting over it. Uh, this, this gentleman is now in second year and uh, obviously has great experience already uh, in, in this notion of layering spray paint and masking creating, creating uh, different shapes. So lots of, lots of talented people here in the cap building uh, do check out the paint room. It is one of the more creative zones in the building in that uh, it's, it, is, it is still uh, available 24 hours. It has a fume hood, which uh, you turn on on the right when you walk into the, into the paint room. You turn on the fume hood, uh, which creates uh, negative pressure. Uh, it's quite loud, so you'll know, you'll know it's working. <laughs> and uh, uh, that's what takes all of the extra paint fumes, aerosol paint fumes, uh, as well as the propellant, uh, which is dangerous for us to be spraying in our studio. We cannot, absolutely cannot, use spray paint anywhere in the building except for the paint room. Uh, you also, uh, uh, so it's very important to, to respect our facility and uh, respect others uh, by only, uh, only doing spray paint in the paint room. Here are some examples from last year. Uh, these are 18 inch wide by 24 inch high pieces of foam core. So you'll be purchasing your own foam core in the CRC or elsewhere. Uh, uh, that is 18 by 24. If it's larger, you just, you're going to have to cut it down. Uh, and uh, this is, these are different, different approaches to the shields. And uh, uh, you can see the edges and negative spaces and shapes that were formed by cutting uh, these, these, these lines, which are all uh, made up of either either uh, hard edges or triangular edges. So it's following the rules in terms of uh, all the different uh, uh, combinations or, or thereof of, of half inch squares. Uh, these are half inch lines here. And so this student's design, really going for symmetry and hierarchy in this case, as, as uh, she, she was telling the story of her particular city. Um, this gentleman uh, also, there's interesting to point out that some symmetry on couple of different sides, but he, uh, he found quickly that one template would work for more than one application with some adjustment. So, so uh, in fact, he created, I believe he created one template for this portion. Uh, so he was able to use that four times. A second template for this portion, I believe he made a third template for this. So actually three templates that came together uh, for this uh, uh, in terms of how it came together on a four-sided uh, uh, radial pattern with a centralized uh, s section, but but also an axis uh, running through. So lots of great organizing and ordering systems found here, but uh, but great example of how a template can be used more than once uh, to mask off different areas. You can see the number three kind of built in there. You look for the number three, it's kind of hidden up here. And if you look for the number three, it's yeah, right in there roughly. So. So some subtle references to the section number. They don't have to be glaring or, or absolutely literal. They can be certainly very subtle and or hidden into the image itself. A few more examples. If you actually turn your head and look at this one, you can see the city skyline uh, reflected in water. And then uh, this very bizarre, perhaps uh, no notable image of a fish, uh, which was notable in this particular student's uh, uh, selection, literature selection. But if you turn your head, there is, that, is a, that is a reference to the city skyline of this particular uh, city that the student, uh, student has read. Um, other notions too, that I believe that uh, the student was able to use a full template twice. That's with a, with a fairly symmetrical option, that is definitely the case. And then he created this octagon with a, with a smaller spray uh, uh, area and they probably used newspaper to mask off the rest. So 
Uh, I'll bring in some newspapers and we'll have plenty of newspaper to help with the masking process. So as you start to construct your templates, cut them out, uh, do, do, do know that you can use them more than once. Uh, they will take the paint just fine. Integration or fun integration of the uh, either one's favorite tile or the numbers. The student's original tile actually lies in sort of this corner. So this is a tile from the previous pro project, and you can see eh, fairly obviously there uh, the number three. So other opportunities to either hide or, or integrate one's favorite tile into it. These were fascinating. Uh, really interesting notion of hierarchy and, and uh, scale here. We can almost feel like we're going up into this this particular design. This one uh, really enjoyed uh, this split notion here of positive between positive and negative. Uh, and again, you can see the references to the number three and uh, and the original tile design brought in directly into the Herald itself. So some really successful, interesting projects projects that come out of this. Altogether, this was their Sparky group from last year. They were they were a they were three sections as opposed to seven, uh, so a smaller number than our total number this this fall. But uh, a a wonderful collection of students uh, um, who came together and, and uh, really rose to the challenge. Some really diverse designs, some really interesting eight bit, if you will, <laughs> uh, notions uh, with with references to the number three. I believe section three is is, is in this middle third, you can see the twos here, so section two from last year, um, uh, and then section one from last year. Uh, and so uh, uh, each one of these was different. Uh, it, it really is distinctive and uh, refreshing to see all of the different approaches to this project that, that came together, and also refreshing to see them all uh, together. It's, it's, it's a really striking image for me as an instructor just to see the, the collective work of, of, of y'all and how that can uh, really start to enhance our, our notions of this project and of the literature and otherwise. So we'll look for some opportunities to, to display these in the building. Uh, it was certainly our goal last year to try to make a, make a, a full mural of them. Uh, uh, not sure if we could do that yet, but, uh, but at any rate, we will look for some opportunities to display these in the building uh, and, uh, and, and sort of a medieval guild hall or or knight's hall or, or a court hall um, of some kind could, could be an uh, object for some good conversation uh, in our near future. So thank you very much. I look forward to speaking with you individually on your, on your process work. Get some graph paper printed out and uh, start, start some sketches, and uh, I'll see you at your desks shortly.